the reason we're here today, again, is to talk about how we can address the digital divide and bring more older adults into digital device access. So as everyone here should be well aware, DIFTA um, has been undertaking a, a, a pretty robust device distribution, which is underway and tablets are being distributed and training resources are available to help support our older adults to make them comfortable and ensure that these devices are useful, relevant, and comfortable to them. We are going to be tackling all of the questions that you shared with us in the training registration, and we'll be centering our conversation around three primary topics. The first part of our conversation will focus on marketing and buy-in. How do we make older adults interested and sometimes less afraid of accessing digital devices? The second part of our conversation will focus on how do we orient new users? What are the fundamentals that we need to cover to ensure success of the distribution? And then finally, we'll be talking and doing a deep dive into training pathways. Um, you have resources available to you. What makes sense? What are some different approaches you could use and strategies that you can undertake, again, that could help um, foster the success of the implementation? There are various aspects to training and marketing, and we welcome your feedback throughout. Um, what this forum is going to look like, each of the panelists are going to speak for a few minutes, introduce themselves, talk about their organizations and some of the services that they offer. And then Sapir and I and Michael will be asking questions to the different panelists. We encourage you to join the conversation. And if you have any questions or comments that you want to tag, to put them in the chat. So we have four panelists that are here with us today. Um, the first is Lyman Clay Claiborne and Rania from the Brooklyn Public Library. Following their presentation, we have Liz Hamburg from Can Do, Brenda Rusnick from Cyber Seniors, and Tom Camber from Oats from AARP. Um, so let's um, get started with the Brooklyn Public Library. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lyman Claiborne. I am the coordinator of services for older adults at Brooklyn Public Library. And you'll be hearing in the latter part of my portion from my associate, Rania Bakar. Um, I started with Brooklyn Public Library in March of 2020, literally six days before we were all sent home into quarantine. And within a month, we were pivoting to virtual programming. As you can well imagine, um, as the coordinator for services for older adults, uh, older adults were having a struggle with virtual. And so um, with the library's development team, I was able to apply for a grant with the good people at New York Community Trust, and we called this initiative Technology for All at the library, which I will get into. Um, I will share my screen now. I'm going to just um, start with my information so that if you want to jot down uh, my email address, lclaiborne at bklynlibrary.org and then the telephone number two services for older adults 718-236-1760 extension six uh, the library does have what's called a trs a technology uh, specialist at each and every branch but what i observed that we were lacking was the services for older adults department did not even have its own TRS or technology associate, so to speak. And so that's why I was so glad to be able to hire Rania Bakar, who is our digital literacy associate that you will meet. Um, and she, uh, I knew her actually from, we worked together with New York Public Library, uh, the enemy, so to speak, um, over at the Andrew High School Braille and Talking Book Library for the Blind. So we both have extensive um, experience uh, mine coming from library management since 2007 and Rania's coming uh, since 2018 or earlier. 
um, with libraries, especially older adults and those with low vision or blindness. So uh, Technology for All, we do have a two-year grant and a partner with us is OATS, uh, who I think you'll meet later on, the Older Adults Tech Nickel services um, with AARP. Um, and we're basically at the library trying to reduce the digital divide among older adults. Um, for marketing purposes, you could definitely um, say that Brooklyn Public Library is a place you can send older adults. As I mentioned, there is a technology specialist at each and every branch. Um, but today, we just want to focus on telling you what we have um, through services for older adults in our outreach department. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to gain access, um, we, uh, as I said, hired Rania that you will be meeting. Uh, we also have done 30 technology classes um, virtually for our older adults. So these were open to the public um, and these were coordinated and conducted by OATS uh, under the auspices of Senior Planet. And we um, gave sessions to our older adults on Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, delivery apps, uh, keeping your information safe, etc. Um, next slide, please. So the way that we began providing one-on-one -on -one training um, due to COVID-19, we did have our patrons meeting Rania, our digital literacy associate, by Zoom or simply by telephone or FaceTime. And this was all done through the library website. Um, we are doing we were doing those Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday virtually, either on Zoom, FaceTime, or over the telephone. Um, from 11 to 3. Um, and Rania has English, Arabic, and Spanish that she could, that she did these uh, trainings. Next slide, please. So I'm going to now um, mute myself and let Rania unmute herself so that you can get to know her and she can explain to you the exciting things that are coming in the future. We have actually been approved by the library to have in person uh, one-on-ones and not just the over the phone or the Zoom or the virtual program. So we're really excited about that. And Rania can really get more in depth into the nuts and bolts of what patrons have been asking her about and what she can help them with, including the tablets uh, that NYCHA has. Um, so far, Rania has had 72 patrons and that's since June 29th. Um, and as far as the Oats presentations that we've had, we've had um, over 300 patrons that have joined those virtually. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Rania Bakar. Rania. Hi, everyone. My name is Rania Bakar. I'm the Digital Literacy Associate at Brooklyn Public Library, New Trick Branch in Brooklyn, Bensonhurst. Um, so we are starting in person on January 5th. So that's a Wednesday. Um, the location will be, of course, at New Utrecht Library. Uh, the address is listed on the PowerPoint presentation. It's 1743 86th Street at ba uh, Bay 17th Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11214. We will have the sessions repeatedly uh, weekly, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, so it's three patrons per day. So on Wednesday, it would be scheduled from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m then from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. and 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. and same goes for Thursdays. Now we will still be uh, doing virtual uh, individual sessions on Tuesdays, just in case the patron um, isn't, able, isn't capable of coming to the library. Next slide, please. Um, Digital Literacy Associate Services. So I offer services for iPhone and Android smartphones. Um, so basically, I teach the settings, the applications, um, everything that comes with it, computer uh, support. I teach Google Suite, Microsoft uh, 365, Outlook, Gmail. I do uh, virtual programs like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Google Chat. I can teach social media. So there's YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and there are uh, BPL apps such as the Libby app, 
and the ebook support. Next slide, please. Uh, for the tablet support specifically, um, I can teach them the applications and accessibilities. So basically how to use the Play Store, um, how to use the accessibilities on the settings. Uh, some patrons like to use the Zoom, um, like to use voice uh, settings. Um, even if they're not blind or visually impaired, they just like that advantage. Um, I can teach them how to download uh, applications uh, from their Play Store. Um, I can teach them how to use these settings. So the settings um, includes the uh, how to connect to their Wi-Fi, how to set up uh, Bluetooth, uh, um, how to uh, connect to their um, uh, to other devices, uh, um, etc. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, since it's a tablet and it's an LG tablet, I'm, uh, I'm sure they'll be using their Gmail a lot. So that means they'll be using Google Suite instead of Microsoft 365. And uh, as we all know, Google Suite is a free um, um, web service that we could use um, to access docs, sheets, and um, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google Drive and slides. So instead of using Microsoft w Word or Microsoft uh, Excel or Microsoft PowerPoint, these are the uh, free versions um, of this software. Uh, so it's Google. Uh, so in order to have Google Suite, they have to have their Gmail account. And um, I would be teaching them how to create uh, their Gmail account and how to use their email as well to access any information. Uh, and the Google Drive, of course, which stores all their information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, virtual programs. So in order to participate in uh, various present um, presentations or webinars, uh, they need to know how to use Zoom and Google Chat and Microsoft, if they, if they have um, the reason to use Microsoft Team as well. Um, I would be able to teach them how to use Zoom and um, Google Chat. Next slide, please. Social media. A lot of patrons ask about social media because it, it's um, um, one of their hobbies to get connected with other um, family members or relatives or friends. Uh, so that, well, that's where Instagram and Facebook comes along. Um, I will teach them how to use their uh, the feeds, um, how to set their privacy settings, how to uh, create accounts, of course, how to um, uh, connect with others, how to add friends, how to control their settings, etc. And uh, as for YouTube, how to use their e email information to create an account and how to subscribe to different um, channels, how to create their own channel uh, so they can connect um, with uh, the, their, subscri uh, the their subscribers. Um, and that's basically it for social media. The next slide, please. And this is my information. So my name is Rania Bakar. Uh, our Bakar at Brooklyn Public uh, Bro B K L Y N Library org. My phone number is seven one eight nine three eight two five two five, and I hope um, my presentation was helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lyman and Rania. A few questions, some from the chat. If if a patron does not live in Brooklyn, are you serving? older adults who live in other boroughs? Yes, we are. Uh, we, in fact, with the virtual world, you really can't control it. We have um, some loyal fans, I must say, from Ohio, California, et cetera, that have followed us since the pandemic and we started virtual programming. So the long answer to your question is yes, we, we will um, offer our services to people 
um, outside of Brooklyn, that's definitely no problem, especially through virtual. Um, as far as the in-person trainings, um, those do require the patron to come to New Utrecht Library. So those patrons may benefit better with starting first with Ronnie virtually or over the phone to see how that goes first. Um, I will have to say uh, on the in-person, um, one thing we didn't mention, um, obviously masks are required by the library during the trainings, uh, six feet apart, Ronnie is going to try that. And then um, there's a health assessment that has to be done the day the patron arrives at the library. So I hope that answers that question very long windedly. Thank you, very thorough, appreciate the clarity. And if, if people, older adults want to access the training virtually, they should contact one of you and that would get them a one-on-one -on -one appointment. Is that right? <laughs> That is correct. And also, if you go to the library's website and you and you select attend, A-T-T-E-N-D, and then you select older adults, Rania always enters every week um, the entry on the library website for both virtual and in person. So the patron can register there online at the library's website if that's easier for them. But yes, a calling or emailing Rania and myself is a basic step. Um, if they do register at the website, if they could please include their phone number, that is helpful. Great. Um, one final question. Um, how much do you customize? I assume if it's one on one, you're really meeting the older adult where they are based on their particular interests or, or is there um, a kind of requisite curriculum that you go through? Rania, if you would like to answer that, please. So uh, it's not um, uh, it's not basically what we want. It's what they uh, uh, they want to learn. So I don't. I this is just um, like um, what what I can teach them, or like a small. It's not very broad. It's just uh, like telling them what I can teach. But there's a lot that we can offer. I can um, offer teaching assistive technology where I teach screen readers, and that's not written here on the, um, the PowerPoint, but that's something that I also offer as well. So it's basically what the patron really wants and to learn. And if I'm capable of teaching it and um, uh, explaining it over the phone, I will tell them that it's uh, that, that I'm capable of doing it. Also, I forgot to mention that um, when I'm doing either a one-on-one -on -one session or there's an individual, uh, there's a virtual session or in-person session, the patron will get a transcript of the session so that they don't have to, they can work independently on the, their own after the session is over. So they don't have to keep coming back to me for the same questions. No, I want them to be as independent as possible and learn um, everything that they were coming for. Great. Thank you so much. What a wonderful resource for everybody. Um, this free citywide resource, um, unless you're coming in person and then you need to live in Brooklyn uh, to uh, push out to your older adults for some one-on-one -on -one, um, client-centered trainings. I do want to respond to a question in the chat and then I'll turn it to our next speaker, Liz. Um, I, I see there's a question there from JASA. Um, so the you will be getting your training funds as hopefully was clear clearly communicated to you through your program officer. If you have questions, we can talk about it more fully in the end. But you have a training allocation that's tied to the number of tablets that you're distributing. Um, the purpose of this session is to um, share with you different approaches and resources and ways that you could potentially use those funds, um, as well as some free resources that you might um, want to provide to your older adults who are looking for that extra level of reinforcement. Um, so hopefully that answered that. And I'm going to turn it to our next presenter, Liz from Can Do Tech. Hi, Liz. Hi, guys. Nice to uh, to see many. I see a lot of familiar names, even though I don't see some of your faces. Um, I also wanted to introduce my colleague, Rachel, who, again, some of you know and have been working with. Rachel's our head of partnership. So um, she will be able to answer a lot of the direct questions she's been working with uh, with many of our clients over the last year and a half. 
And uh, I just wanted to frame a little bit about um, what we what we were doing and what we've been doing during the pandemic, and then really focus on some of the best practices and do's and don'ts that we've we've really learned over the last year and a half. So, uh, by way of introduction, I'm the founder and CEO of Kendu Tech. Um, Kendu Tech started operating in the New York tri-state area in early 2019. We were originally doing in-person visits um, focusing on tech support and training specifically designed for older adults and um, as we were moving along and serving clients across the uh, across the boroughs and into uh, westchester as well we were shut down pretty quickly during the pandemic and we moved to remote only as i know all of us have and it's been a really um, interesting learning curve over the last year and a half but i'm really happy to say that we've had incredible success um, providing support and training remotely. We are now working um, nationwide. We have what we call tech concierges as well as customer support teams working across the country. We're now working with uh, social service organizations, nonprofit groups, um, some of the area agencies on aging and senior living facilities across the country. We've got clients in almost 40 states now. So, but our heart and soul is in New York. I'm from New York, I'm a native New Yorker. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to support many clients in New York. I, as I said, see some familiar faces. We have, um, we're working with JASA, we're working with PSS, um, with Public Health Solutions. Um, I see Kathy from Heights and Hills on today. So um, we have really been um, very excited to continue to support the community. And what we what we have been doing over the last year and a half as we've moved to virtual is a combination of, for those that have tablets and want to set up and manage tablets, we've been helping to set up and manage devices. Um, this is typically on a remote device manager so that we're able to really push content out to update content. We're providing both content and support in English, Spanish, and a little bit in Russian as well. And, um, and so with that content manager and mobile device manager, we're really able to troubleshoot things much more quickly and again, um, be able to control that content and, and um, continue to provide updates. Um, but the core of what we're doing is really both one-on-one -on -one support and group lessons. And as I said, our, our heart of what um, of our service is through our tech concierges. We've um, we basically have we'd love to clone Rania, so we we've cloned um, many many Rania's, and we have uh, tech concierges around the country, and these are um, folks that are trained specifically on how to work with this population. And so we provide a membership model where um, our clients are getting uh, one or two 90-minute sessions. So that typically that first 90-minute session is being used to teach someone how to use the tablet. So we have people who've never touched a smartphone or never touched a tablet in their lives and we're able to get them up and running on a tablet or on a smartphone. And then we provide ongoing support. So if someone does have quick questions about anything from how to get onto a doctor's visit, how to you know, get onto a, a um, call with their family members, how to get onto Zoom, how to download an app, we're able to provide that support on an ongoing basis and we do that through a shared screen. So we, we download software um, and then we're able to share someone's screen and work with them directly through that. And then we also are providing group lessons. And so the first thing that we do typically with, a, with someone with a new tablet is again, get them set up comfortable using Zoom or using whatever the, the platform is so that they can get onto those group lessons. And we're also providing a, a series of how-to guides. Um, so what's worked and what hasn't worked over the last year and a half? Um, I'm really happy to say again that that the remote has worked um, it, for the most part really, really well. So even if someone is a total newbie, we are able to get them onto a device and get them comfortable with that device fairly quickly. Um, but you know, one of the most important things, whether you are doing this yourself or uh, using you know a third party partner or hiring someone you know internally, is really having that champion, having that liaison. Again, I, I see some folks on the call who've been amazing champions and liaison. They're liaisons. They're reaching out to their their client base. They're touching base with them on a regular basis. They're encouraging them, um, and so that is really really important. You know, it, it's the if you build it, they do not always come. You know, so you can hand someone a tablet. Um, you can give them Wi-Fi access or broadband. You can tell them about all the great classes that you have. But if you're not encouraging them and teaching them how to use those devices and then having someone there to support them, whether that's internally or externally, we found that very often it's a very expensive paperweight. So that is, I would say, the number one 
lesson. And again, Rachel on my team has been has been great about getting the liaisons up to speed, providing them with, you know, whether it's marketing material, um, blogs, you know, information to pass along to clients. But having that internal advocate and liaison is really, really critical to a successful program. The other thing I would say is understand the level of where your clients are. Again, what we've seen is there are total newbies who, who've never used a device before. Um, and there are folks that you know feel really comfortable with a smartphone or tablet, but they just need that extra help to get onto Zoom, to get onto a doctor's visit, to learn something new. So understand where your clients are coming for, from, and then make sure that they understand the basics. Don't assume that someone knows where that on off switch is or where that volume button is. We have so many clients who say, yeah, yeah, I know how to use it, but oh yeah, where, how do I turn that power on again? So, you know, start with the basics. Um, again, how to guides are great. We have, I think most everyone on this call has, has great libraries of content that they can deliver. And that's really, really important. The other thing, and Rania pointed out, and, and we see that a lot, and we have um, our tech concierges are specially trained to address accessibility needs. So really we're focused on one of the first questions we'll ask is, do you wear hearing aids? Would you like your hearing aids connected? Do you need your font size adjusted? Do you have macular degeneration? You know, do you need a black screen with white, with white font? So really focusing on their needs and meeting them where they, where they are. Maybe someone with mobility issues that needs to have um, voice control put on. So um, thinking about those accessibility needs and making sure that the tablet or the device is adapted to that. Um, the other learning is hi avoid hybrid situations. And again, we learned this the hard way, um, you know, and I think this is gonna come up more and more as we move into this, um, this hybrid world of some remote and some in person. Again, we're learning and adapting all the time and would be very interested to hear, you know, others sharing best practices. But what we have found is, um, you know, we've tried the, the sort of the Charlie Brown teacher approach where we've got a group of people in the room and, and our instructors are virtual. And, you know, frankly, it does sound like the Charlie Brown teacher. It's like, wah, 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 wah. You know, and so we, we've really learned that um, it's best to have everyone in the room or everyone virtual. And uh, that, that kind of hybrid where half the people can see each other, half the people are on screen, it's hard to hear because you don't have speakers in the room can be very, very challenging. So again, very curious to hear if anyone has found a solution there. But I would say that as you're thinking about hopefully returning to, to in-person as much as we can, I would really encourage you to think about, you know, keeping those classes um, either in-person or virtual. Um, I talked a little bit about the mobile device manager. Again, we have found that if you are handing out tablets or devices, it's very helpful to have them managed. It's not always necessary, but I would say that that is um, kind of best practices and something that has made it much easier to, um, to get that sort of that, that content to everyone and to troubleshoot as needed. Um, the other thing is make sure that your team is trained. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of folks that are relying on volunteers that are relying on, um, on staff within your, you know, your own staff to do this. And I think it's fantastic. And again, um, we know that there's different, um, different levels of, of service and different budgets and things like that. But I would say that whomever you're using to do the training, make sure that they're doing that consistently and, and make sure that there's some level of, um, of training or you know, basic materials that everyone's working from, working off of at the same time. Um, and then the other thing is it's not enough to just do that initial training and say, hey, you know, good luck. And so we have found that it is really important to do that initial training, but also have some way for folks to be able to come back and ask those quick questions, whether that's asking them of your staff, going to, um, to online resources, but just having some way for them to get those quick questions addressed. And then lastly, um, surveying. I know, again, many of you are doing that. Um, we have found it's very, very helpful to get a baseline at the beginning of a project to know, again, is someone coming from you know, absolute ground zero? What would they like to learn? Rania gave some great examples of, of the kind of content um, that's available, you know, we found it's really helpful to know what are the kind of classes that people are looking for, um, what kind of devices, if you're not, if they're not all on the LG, you know, what are the devices that they have, um, what kind of devices will you need to support, and then, um, again, being able to move that needle, you know, especially, hopefully, DIFTA is going to keep funding you guys going forward, but I'm sure that Jocelyn would love to know um, how we've had an impact and how you're moving the needle, so what we've seen is, again, Great progress on moving the needle. So a lot of folks that you know went from that baseline to being able to say yes, they are 
you know, more social, less socially isolated, more engaged, um, be able to get onto telemedicine visits, um, be able to access information. There's lots of great ways that, um, that we can show that we're, we're all moving the needle. So those are just some quick tips. Again, happy to, uh, happy to answer questions. And um, I will just uh, whoop, leave my, my email up there. Sorry, just um, it's Liz at Can Do Tech. I'll put it in the chat and um, happy to answer questions. And Rachel too has been on the ground and um, we're, we're very eager to hear from others and, and share our learnings as well. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you for being such a, a great partner in this work and, and with many of our colleagues on the call. I um, just wanted to underline a few things you said. I, I thought it was really interesting how you talked about the different training pathways, whether it's all virtual or all in person. There were some comments from our colleagues at PSS about the hybrid, so that would be a great thing to dig into later. I definitely relate. Um, I found in conversations where it's a mix, it, it can be more challenging. So I'm curious um, to, to learn more from the group about how, how they've mitigated some of those challenges. I also thought what you and Rania said about the accessibility point is such an important point and potentially um, a source that's in, intimidating to older adults who have visual or hearing impairments and, and are wondering how they could use this device. So I think that's a really important thing for everybody in this conversation to be messaging older adults that there are ways um, to, to support those needs and challenges in this implementation. Also curious to dig more um, with you as we talk about marketing and buy-in around uh, what you talked about with um, creating champions internally to really help move and push this work. And yes, we love your comment about the surveys. I think it's really important. And I've, ha I've had this conversation with others on this call, inclu including our colleagues from OATS, from ARP, that you know, as the city is investing in, in addressing the digital divide, that we really need to prove um, the effectiveness and outcomes associated with that. And finally, there were some comments in the chat, um, some questions around who are we supporting in this work? We've begun with the OACs, the older adult centers, really focused on access to virtual programming and supporting older adults to access that as we continue to scale and make that work um, more nimble and accessible to older adults. We really wanna get ready as we continue down this pathway. Um, we are expanding eligibility to include legal service providers, case management, caregivers, elder abuse, and NORCs. Um, so we began with the OAC, um, but some of you have just not gotten the email yet, but we really want to um, arm our older adults with technology and training and bring them into to this world and, and the opportunities that it provides them. So thank you so much. Um, and next, I would like to introduce another wonderful partner um, who has supported a number of our programs and implementations, Brenda from Cyber Seniors. Hi, Brenda. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, just so that you know, I am the managing director of Cyber Seniors, and Cyber Seniors is a nonprofit uh, organization that was founded in 2015 after the release of a documentary film with the same name, Cyber Seniors. Um, some of you may have seen it. The film followed a group of teenagers as they mentored older adults who had never used technology before. And it did extremely well. It was broadcast in 40 countries around the world, including PBS and Netflix. And it really served as a proof of concept for our intergenerational volunteer tech training model. Uh, the mission of Cyber Seniors is to bridge the digital divide and connect generations through technology. And our focus has always been on making sure seniors are socially connected and self-sufficient. Prior to COVID, we worked with partners throughout the country to deliver cyber seniors programs in person. We developed resources that they used and those programs were very, very highly effective. Um, one of the challenges that we always faced though when we did in-person programming is, is that we really weren't reaching 100% um, of seniors, particularly those that were living in rural communities. And we had a lot of 
individuals that just simply couldn't get out to the in-person programs during the winter months. So for us, COVID um, was uh, eye-opening and it really um, allowed us to um, explore virtual training, um, which has been incredibly successful. So over the past seven years, our organization has continually built upon our mentor training program. And our mentor training program basically takes anyone that's interested in volunteering for us through a training program. Um, most of our mentors are in fact uh, university college students, some high school students, but we also have older adults who volunteer for us. Uh, we've been well supported through Best Buy Foundation to develop a really enhanced training program for our volunteers. So we've got different levels of, of training. Um, our most advanced training program takes people through a nine month training period. It's an after school program. A lot of universities and colleges use our mentor training program as part of their course curriculum. So for example, a pharmacy class um, has, has made it a mandatory, at University of Rhode Island has made it a mandatory requirement for all of their students to take the mentor training program with cyber seniors and to volunteer because they realize that those are skills that people that are going to be working in the medical profession are gonna to need to have. So that's the one side of our organization. Um, and then of course, we, um, so we've trained over 2,500 volunteers. Um, and needless to say, we have a very strong volunteer base that supports our tech training program and allows us to deliver um, a really highly effective training program for older adults. So how our programs work is that our professional staff design all the training programs and oversee the delivery of the training programs, while our volunteer mentors provide one-on-one -on -one support and they provide seniors with the opportunity to practice what they have been taught. So our program for training um, individuals in new devices starts with um, everyone that has gotten a device receives a phone call from one of our professional staff. Um, those phone calls uh, can be, it can be one phone call or it can be several, whatever it takes. But basically the goal of that phone call is to uh, walk the person through setting up their new device, um, establishing an email for them if they haven't, if they don't have one yet. And many people that are getting devices for the first time don't even have an email. And then we teach them how to get onto Zoom or whatever platform is being used uh, to teach them. And that's really up to the agency that we're working with. Uh, 95% of our trainees are able to get onto Zoom uh, just through us walking them through the process over the phone. Uh, 5% uh, do require in-person instruction, but we work with the agency to make sure that those individuals don't fall through the cracks. So we'll identify that this person is not making progress. And then normally what happens is that our partner will then um, arrange for somebody to go and meet with that person and teach them to get onto Zoom. Um, our programs are all custom designed, each training program. Uh, again, we work with our partner uh, to establish what the goals of the program are. So for example, if we're training um, uh, a group of foster grandparents, we're focusing on training them and teaching them how to use their new device to carry out their volunteer um, uh, work. Uh, but if we're working with a city, for example, we are going to probably focus on uh, teaching those individuals how to access resources that are in their community, how to access, um, how to get a library card online, how to access um, books online. Um, how to download the public transit app. That's a big one. Um, and so that's, that's basically how we design it. Then we generally do four group interactive sessions. And this includes instruction followed by Q&A. And again, we don't want to bombard them with too much information. We want to keep the information uh, as relevant as possible um, and um, encourage them to ask questions. But we also know that everybody learns at different levels, and some people are too shy to ask questions um, in a group setting. Um, I mean, we've all been in that situation where you're listening to somebody in a lecture, and you know, you kind of zone off for a second, and you come back in, and you can't remember. You're not quite sure whether they actually covered that or not, and it's embarrassing. You don't want to ask the question if they've just covered it. So following the sessions, we encourage 
um, all the participants to sign up for one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And one-on-one -on -one mentoring is all done with our volunteer base. Uh, so, um, and we use a secure platform, it's called uh, Twilio Flex. So our volunteers don't see the numbers of the seniors they're calling. Seniors don't see the numbers that of, of our volunteers. Everything is taped and they can start on the phone. It always starts with a phone call, but they can move to a platform. And really we encourage them to practice what they had learned in the session before and to ask any questions that they were too shy um, to ask or, or ask or just to, for a refresher. Um, so after the four sessions, and the four sessions are usually one week apart, um, at the completion, um, we encourage the participants to join in on our free online community. So um, the Cyber Seniors website, cyberseniors.org, um, has daily tech webinars in English and Spanish. Um, we have social webinars, health and wellness webinars, exercise, fitness, um, we've really expanded upon our, our uh, curriculum. Um, and we encourage the seniors to join in on that community. But we also encourage them to continue to search out things that are relevant to them and then call us and book a one-on-one -on -one appointment to explore that. Because one of the keys that we have found is that if we really want to be successful in long-term adaptation, um, we need to um, allow that individual uh, to um, find what's, what's, re what's relevant to them personally and uh, to explore those opportunities um, using, using their new device. Um, yeah, so some of the things that I think is, you know, the keys to our success, our success have been to um, get the individual turned on and to find relevancy as quickly as possible. What we have noticed is that if an individual um, takes too long um, to get their device set up, if that's just too daunting for them, um, they very early on de determine that this is not something for them. So we need to get them over that hurdle very, very quickly, which is why we rely um, on our partners to uh, step in if the virtual setup is just taking too long because that in itself um, can, can basically turn the individual off of using it altogether. Um, the other thing is that they need to practice. You know, sitting in a lecture and learning something, we've all been there where you think you've got it and then you go to do it and you think, okay, now I can't, I can't figure it out. I can't remember what they said. So practice is really, really important. Um, and good communication between ourselves and whatever the agency is that we're working with. We've, de we've devised a communication platform whereby we keep, uh, in real time, we let the agency know um, who, who we've been in contact with, who's attending the group sessions, who seems to have dropped off. Um, and we work together to make sure that um, nobody falls through the cracks. And I think that that's it. Thank you so much, Brenda, and thank you for the great work you've done with a number of our programs and for being such a great partner. Um, I thought first up, please um, include the documentary in the chat. Sounds fascinating. I know it'll go on my movie list. Um, it, it sounds um, so interesting. And um, again, this is another Cyber Seniors is also providing options and different ways that older adults can access training and information. And I thought you, you talked about um, some really important points, monitoring the drop off and the usage and creating a safe space to ask for help, which is something um, we talked to one of our providers earlier today, and they were talking so much about the need for at least some level of one on one. Um, and how so many people feel uncomfortable in groups, even groups of three, small groups um, of, of people that they might know from their center to say, you know, I spaced out and lost the last two minutes of this, or I didn't <laughs> follow you at all when the rest of the group at least appears um, to be following along. So I, th I think that's so important um, as we're learning something new and sometimes uncomfortable. So thank you so much. Um, finally, I'm going to introduce Tom from OATS by ARP. I think many of you are very familiar with OATS. 
um, and their work with the NYCHA 10,000 tablet distribution, as well as their ongoing partnership with so many of you. So hi, Tom and Alex. Hi, Jocelyn, and thank you for having us today. And I'm, I'm super excited to be presenting with this panel um, and just also really grateful DIFT has been providing so much leadership on this. And I think that this effort to distribute tablets out through the centers is really unprecedented. And, you know, people have been asking for it for such a long time. And I think it just says a lot that you guys are going to, to all the way through with us and people are, you know, empowered to do the trainings and it's a good session. And I've got some old friends on this call and some new ones. So I'm happy to to, to share with you. Um, I also have Alex Glazebrook here with me who is running, he is our Director of Program Operations and he is going to put uh, some things up in the chat as I speak so that we don't have to um, turn off the camera to do a PowerPoint, but he is available for follow-up on anything I say. So he's gonna put his email in there. And if you email him, you should put DIFTA tablets as your subject line so that you will know what it's about. and. Uh, people can follow up with him and get support directly. Um, for those of you who are new to OATS, uh, I'm the executive director. Um, OATS was uh, a labor of love founded in Brooklyn, New York in 2004, working directly with a bunch of uh, very uh, intrepid older adults at the Betty Shabazz Center. And we started out working with DIFTA in 2005 and built a really strong training model based on a kind of a co-design method with older adults sitting with us, helping to figure out what people need in order to get online and what kinds of interventions are most efficient and uh, most impactful, not just in getting them online, but also helping them use the technology for social purposes. One of the things that I think we're really um, proud of or distinguished by is our focus on outcomes that are related to aging. So uh, we feel like getting people to learn technology is just one piece of a puzzle in changing the way that our country thinks about aging and helping activate a lot of really powerful um, activities and developments in the grassroots and with our partners so that people can really tie our programming into you know, health and wellness and into financial security for people and efforts to rekindle their social networks, but also helping older adults get that chance to lead in their communities. Um, so many of the people that have been part of Senior Planet are now uh, active out in the, the neighborhoods and they're in the newspapers and they're making a difference, not just for themselves, but for their area of, uh, of uh, whether it's geographic or just an area of interest. So um, over the years, uh, we, we started out doing trainings kind of in all of the centers that many of you are calling in from. We've taught at over 100 different centers, uh, DIFTA centers uh, in New York City alone, and worked with a lot of housing developments. We've worked at Brooklyn Public, as, uh, as they mentioned earlier, in Lyman. Brooklyn Public is my personal favorite library of all in the whole country. I think it's an amazing place. Um, and we've also worked with the New York Public, your hated uh, you know, uh, competitors across the ridge, uh, but we also think that they're They've done some great stuff. We've worked in, um, you know, a whole bunch of nitrogen facilities in different environments. And then about um, eight or nine years ago, we started the Senior Planet Center in Manhattan, which is the country's first technology themed community center for older adults that was designed around the area of helping older people use technology uh, and activating their, their impact. The OATS mission is to harness technology to change the way we age. Uh, that's what we're, that's our sort of, uh, uh, you know, lodestar for the kind of change we're, we're thinking about. And when we got the Senior Planet Center up and running, we called it Senior Planet instead of OATS because it's a community for older people. It's not, you know, we don't want them going to the OATS website and learning about, you know, reading my 990 report or whatever it is. We want them going to uh, a site where they can connect to each other and, and, and do things like build a business together with other people or make friends with somebody in another state. And so we created Senior Planet as that kind of age positive community for older people. And that site has become a kind of reference point for a lot of people around what's possible and helping people come in and, you know, we don't invent all the programs ourselves. We work together with older people who are coming in with ideas and they want to do a fashion show for all of the, um, the clothing that they're making and they want to market it online or uh, they wanted to do a comedy hour, which they did this last year. And we had, um, you know, a bunch of people over the age of 60 doing stand up uh, and, and across the country, we had people participating and about halfway through, I was fairly sure I was going to lose my job over it, but it was, um, it's amazing what people do when they're learning the tech. And 
The Senior Planet Center was also part of a federal project that we worked on with DIFTA that was incredibly successful. DIFTA really helped us a lot with it. And we were able to build 24 computer labs and DIFTA sites free of charge to the older adult um, locations and also build the Senior Planet content library and our, our, our technology training model. Um, so fast forwarding to today, uh, a few years ago, we started working outside of New York. We expanded into five different states. And um, we have a real interest in rural technology. We have an interest in bridging different kinds of demographic uh, areas so that we've got different languages and different types of folks involved. But we're always celebrating that idea that as we get older, we can get better and we can get stronger. And we're also really serious about the social impact and outcomes that we do. So, you know, Alex won't tell you, but he has a PhD in social work. And we spend a lot of time sitting around the office um, thinking about the next way to evolve our metrics. We've got, um, well over 10,000 uh, surveys that have been filled out by seniors that came through our program and did the basic trainings and gave us feedback about sort of what worked and what they were getting uh, out of the programs. We've also done external studies with the New York Academy of Medicine, which studied our program over a period of uh, like a uh, you know a couple of years of training and then following up with people. We've done uh, quite a lot of work with Columbia University and particularly Cornell around building uh, metrics and, and questionnaires that are um, that are from, built drawn from literature that's really well founded in, in the uh, health and sociology areas so that people can really evaluate, for example, if a person takes your course, are they more socially engaged? Or if a person takes your course, are they healthier? How do we hold ourselves accountable to do that and share data so we get enough information that we're building that long-term momentum for everybody on this call, everybody in this field who's interested in it. If we can take the, the investment that DIFT is making and then show that 10,000 older people are sleeping better, saving more money, being more connected, living more successfully, independently, contri contributing to their communities, then there will be another 10,000 tablets in the future. And then DIFTA can make the case that this is an area of investment that really builds the city's overall strength. So we try to do that to kind of um, re re report on these things. This year, we did a report called Aging Connected, which was a national study supported by the Humana Foundation, uh, where we were analyzing what it is about older adults. Uh, how do we, what do we know about who's online and who's not online? How big of a problem is it? What kinds of strategies can we enact to go solve that? problem and we ended up on the Today Show and we were in the New York Times. It got a lot, a lot of attention and um, built some momentum around building more subsidies around technology access. So there's a couple of new federal subsidy programs that we helped advocate for, which we could talk about if people are curious about the emergency broadband benefit or the next round of the uh, affordable connectivity program, which is going to be a big deal for people outside of this group of 10,000. And then Two other things to talk about. One is um, the uh, the city, uh, the mayor's office was really, really out in front of the issue of uh, how to get some tablets distributed when COVID started. So we did this 10,000 tablet distribution through NYCHA. Um, Alex and his team put together emergency curriculum that would help people. We already had about... Um, uh, we, we have a very extensive curriculum online. When COVID started, we switched all of our curriculum onto the internet. We've done 6,500 class sessions online this year with 270,000 participants. We teach in English, Mandarin, Cantonese, Russian, um, uh, some Bengali, Spanish. Um, we have a Spanish and an English curriculum for the LG uh, the GPAD, that's the one that you all have received from DIFTA. So that's a written curriculum that can be delivered. And then Alex's team put together um, an air call system, which is a call center that's got the ability to take different calls on different topics and um, route them to our trainers who have expertise on that. And we use the air call system with this NYCHA distribution to call all 10,000 people in the system, um, alert them that the tablets were coming and do very much, very similar to what Brenda and, and Liz were talking about earlier. Um, and actually Sapir as well, um, the, alignment rather this this idea of the the one-on-one -on -one training for people who are just getting started really really important to do that um, i think it's absolutely critical for people that are beginning so lesson number one jocelyn uh in terms of getting out there one is link the training and the technology to the advancement of our success as older adults i think that's really critical so so make it a social mission in addition to a technology mission number two is for very beginners, you've got to talk to one-on-one. -on -one. They just can't just get a flyer or you know show up at a big group class. They need that direct help. Somebody's got to handhold them for that first hour or two to get them set up with the with the uh, the uh, email account that jo that Brenda was talking about to get them going. Just to work out the logistics and know that they're not going to get left off at the edge of a cliff. And once people get going, they can be converted to Zoom. So lesson two or three, I guess it's we're up to is once you've been able to do that 
customized training and support for people, you can convert about 25% of them in our expertise, in our experience, will convert into multi-week Zoom classes. And we got about 2,500 people in the NYCHA project to do the, the OATS five-week class online. It's got 10 sessions. Um, it's very structured. Our trainers, you know, deliver it in the different languages and with a lot of um, capacity, but it's really important to get those people who want to do it up to that stage where they can take advantage of that class. And then the call center is available for tech support, which is where, you know, a group like CanDo is shining. Um, I mean, they're doing a lot more than just tech support these days, but they need the tech support and somebody's got to be able to handle those calls. And so we've been dealing with a lot of them and Alex has put our, our, our phone numbers and things up there and he'll rep repost them. But that, you know, one of the big messages is that there's a bit of a, an arc of the user journey from, you know, concern about what, you know, is this a bad thing for me or who do I trust or can I even get involved in this to getting over that threshold. I, I spoke with a, a director at one of the senior centers who said, we just sent out um, robocalls with my voice on it. And so since it was me talking talking to them, they thought it was really cool and they felt more trusting and they were more able to participate in the program. It could be something as simple as that to help push people into a more comfortable scenario as they're learning, but then you've got to imagine the, the various paths that they're going to take. Some people already have some experience and they just need a little bit of touch to get going and they want to be part of your senior planet community. Other people want to get going with something more robust and take a five-week course so they really learn it. And then others are going to do it and they'll kind of get their friend or family member to coach them and they're not going to be part of the system. And we want, we don't want to push them or force them if that's not where they want to go with it. So you have to have a little bit of you know variation in how people get handled. Um, the last point I want to make, and I know we've got to, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions, but um, we then um, became an affiliate of AARP this year. So we're now part of their, you know, uh, countrywide operation. We're working in multiple states with their teams on different projects. And we've been able to tease out some of, we're basically piloting and prototyping different models for how to help people with these programs now around the country. So we did 300 tablets in, in San Antonio this year. We did 40 tablets in the North country up in those, those counties that border Canada. Um, Alex and his team in, in, uh, San Antonio developed a hybrid program that you know Liz was, was mentioning earlier. We knew that people are going to try that. So we deliberately went out and said, what does it look like to run this with hybrid? And the staff spent a bunch of time um, teasing out different methodologies. Who gets the technology in front of them? What screen size are you using? Um, how many people can you go online? Do you need two trainers, which turns out you do? And so we now have a working model in hybrid that does work. The net promoter scores are coming back strong and the curriculum seems to work. Um, but not everybody wants to do hybrid. That's fine too. It's just something that we have available. Uh, so we're testing these things out in various environments around the country. And the last thing I'll say is seniorplanet.org should be the first stop for a lot of people because it's got free training every single day. And so if you've got people that you're looking to bring online, you want to give them some support, uh, they go to seniorplanet.org. It's just got the upcoming classes and just, you know, like looking at the ones that are up this week, we've got stuff coming up on food delivery apps and um, creative processes online and uh, higher end Zoom course things. We have a Fit Fusion workout. Um, our morning stretch class gets like 400 people in it every morning that are doing this stretch with this guy who's turning into the like the biggest rock star in online fitness stuff that I've ever seen. And you know, we're just trying different things that work. Not every class has um, you know huge attendance, but we do pretty well. We've got Tai Chi. There's a Spanish club of English speakers learning Spanish. So very very rich and robust curriculum and stuff there. Um, and I just want to say we couldn't do this without the support of DIFTA that's been an incredible partner. And frankly, all, you know, a lot of our energy comes from working directly with older adults and centers around the communities. That's our base. Um, these are our, you know, that's kind of the team that we look to for helping us try things out. So uh, we're available to help. Um, Seedingplant.org is a good place to start. The hotline that Alex put the number up about earlier, you can get it again in a little bit if he wants to repost it is useful, especially for specific people that just want to know where they can call. And then if you've got a pitch for us to work with your team on something a little bit, or you want to explore how to get involved in other roads programs, just email Alex and he can follow up with you. Uh, it probably won't be, I'm not, it might be next week. We'll see, but uh, if we, we can do it the, in the beginning of the year as well. All right. How's that? Great. Thank you so much, Tom. I, I want to start by quoting you. You'll tell me if this is right. Harness technology to change the way we live. We age. We age. Thank you. Yeah. Even better. I harness technology to change the way we age. What a powerful statement and, and frame for the work. And I think that's coupled so well the, the charming story 
um, that you told about the comedy class. Um, we get data, they're magic shows, Tai Chi, the way that we can engage digitally is really endless. And I think you see this in the marketplace in general with the birth and evolution of masterclass, all the resources and catalogs that are out there for um, younger people to learn pretty much anything, which certainly um, we're really excited to partner with all of you to bring those same opportunities to older adults. I also think it's um, worth mentioning that Senior Planet, which Tom spoke quite a bit about, is available on, on the device that we gave you. Um, and we'll be right there on the tablet for your older adults. And thank you again for um, mentioning the metrics, really important. And the thing I heard from all of you is client-centered, ongoing support, and that opportunity for one-on-one -on -one engagement, which allows people to ask for help in a very safe and non-threatening way. So um, thank you so much to all of you for your very thorough presentations. Um, I see the chat's been very busy with your questions um, and comments from the presenters. Um, DIFTA is providing this platform to show everybody who's out there um, and who we've been working with in different spaces. So um, please take advantage of all of these resources. Everyone on this call um, have been incredible partners. So um, I wanted to start by tossing a question to the panelists and please um, would love your comments in the chat as well. So one of the things we've been struggling with to some degree is buy-in from the older adults who have never interacted with a tablet and they don't know um, why should they want one? Maybe they, they don't want one, they don't see a utility or they're fearful of learning how to use and navigate it. So how does, a, how does a program drive interest in older adults who are reluctant to use a digital device? Um, can you share some of your experiences and lessons um, that might be useful to the providers? Uh, Tom? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, many, many years ago, we were working in the Upper West Side with a senior center and they were asking that question. They had reached out to the people in the lunchroom and people didn't want to participate. And um, Gail Brewer was the council member. And we went to her and said, you know, what, what do you think we could do here? And we ran what they called a touch tank, which was a, a we set up a whole bunch of technology in the lunchroom and let people come and just play with it, touch, touch it and do things. And what we learned, I mean, it was a really simple concept, but it was uh, really powerful because people came in and they started asking questions and they started becoming curious about things and it demystified it because so often the only place that older people encounter technology is either in a store where somebody's trying to sell it to you and they have an agenda that's not yours or in an environment which is very ageist where a lot of younger people are using technology and, and acting again like it's not really your, this isn't a place for you. And so when older people can come together around a place where there's a kind of really optimistic excitement around the device and it's in a senior or an older person setting, it tends to really activate people's curiosity and then you've got the conversation going. Um, people will come in and, and do that. We try to avoid um, for example, starting with a class on how to stay safe online, because it creates a kind of reinforcement of the topic of fear and negativity and anxiety, which they already have enough of. We'll get to that in the third class, but we don't do it in the first one because it tends to, we want to get people thinking about what would I do with this? Oats actually teaches a five-week course called Digital Culture that has in each of our five impact areas, which are social, financial, health, civic, and creative, that has a specific set of things that people can do um, to activate themselves around those topics. And then at the end of the five weeks, they would then be assumed to go pick one of those areas to get more deeply into. So it's really about capturing people's attention, situating it in, the, in a, a place where it feels really safe for older people, um, giving them sort of purposes that they think that can, can be achieved through that work. Uh, and then I think really then just staying with people until they're, uh, they know that you're not gonna let go of them or disappear on them so that they don't come and invest a whole bunch of time and energy and then find out that, you know, oh, my contract's done, so I'm leaving and they're left with like half a course or something like that. So people really need that trust to get built up. Thank you, Tom. Um, Liz, you wanted to add to that? 
Yeah, well, I, I love what Brenda was saying, and we found that to be so true, is you really need to start where someone's interests are. You know, if you say to someone, do you need a tablet? I mean, I remember when, when I got my first iPad, I was like, what the hell do I need an iPad for? I've lived, you know, however long without it. What am I going to do with this thing? But when I started using it, you know, all of a sudden now I can't live without it. And so what we found is saying to an older adult, would you like a new device? They're like, I've lived 80 years. I don't need a new device. If you say, would you like to attend your grandchild's graduation, you know, if you can't travel, or would you like to play cards with your friends online or something in the context of what they like to do and maybe what they're missing or what they're not able to do now, that makes a huge difference. And I think, Tom, you're right. The, you know, the confidence level is also really, really important. You know, start with small wins. You know, you can start with the very, very basics. If they can do one thing, if they can click on the Zoom link or if they can get their first email, you know, our name, you know, the can do is really true and can do like once they start saying, oh, my God, I can do it, you know, and it can be something very, very simple. But once they realize they can do it, then they start moving on and they want to either share that with someone else. You know, there's definitely a lot of, of pay it forward and teach it forward that we've seen, as well as then once they've dipped that toe into the water, then feeling more comfortable to try the next thing. Great. Thank you so much, Brenda. Did you want to add to that? Sure. Um, well, when we did in-person programs, I can tell you that a huge draw uh, was our intergenerational aspect of our program, uh, because a lot of seniors that just really weren't interested in technology at all were interested in in coming and being with younger people. It, so that was kind of, you know, one of the draws. Now, of course, um, when we're doing it virtually, it's a little bit different. But one of the things that uh, we start with is a phone call on a landline. It's, you know, I shouldn't say on a land, like some people give their cell phones, but it's, you have to start at the point where people are not going to be intimidated in, in their comfort level. And most seniors are still very, very comfortable on the phone. And I think that the second thing is, is that to make it, um, to make sure that whoever's helping them is friendly and right from the get go makes it clear that they are going to be very, very patient and there's not going to be any rush or judgment. I mean, we've all been on the phone when somebody's going, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like, and then you get all nervous and you think, oh my God, I can't do this, right? So it's got to be somebody. And we listen to our calls and we listen to some of the recorded calls and it makes a huge difference when there's not this, this rush. Like I, you know, I've got to make as many calls as possible. Um, you know, everybody gets an hour um, and then there's the opportunity to reschedule. And then of course the relevancy. Um, you know, you have to you have to make it relevant for them. They, ha they have to figure out as quickly as possible how that, that device is going to enhance their life. Because if it's not going to enhance their life, they're not going to buy into it. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, some, some great comments and experiences. I love the idea of have something there so they could see it and touch it. Um, and again, meeting the client where they're at and um, certainly relate um, through the older adults in my life. And me personally, I, I remember when I first got my iPhone, I thought I don't need to be buzzing all the time or doing all of this. And now um, that we're all in it, most of us are, are pretty connected to our phones and iPads and devices. Um, so such great points. Do you have suggestions around effective ways to engage older adults whose primary language is not English? And can you talk about how you work with those clients? Um, Brenda, did you want to take it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the best solution is to find somebody that speaks their language. So, you know, we, we I mean, Spanish is a must. Um, you know, you have to be able to, to offer training in Spanish, which we do. And we, we've been very successful in training um, groups of individuals that speak a different language as well. It just takes a little bit of time sometimes to uh, find somebody that we can train to do the training. But we do, I mean, we have a lot of volunteers that speak a number of different languages. Um, so we can use them as interpreters as well. Um, but it really is key. I mean, you know, if you're not speaking the language, um, it's hard and, it, and it's even hard to do it through interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've experimented with um, this, this, I think it's a Zoom feature that translates as, as you speak or dictates in a different language. Um, it works a little bit, but, you know, again, people are having to read it in, as opposed to listening to it. So, 
Um, there are different tricks and, and um, ways in which you can do it. But I think the key is that if you really want to be successful, you've got to find somebody um, that you can train to do that training for you in that language. So if it's um, if I have a client who speaks Russian or something other than Spanish, um, can can you um, Brenda and Tom, Liz, Lehman, Rania talk about um, how how tactically what's the best strategy for trying to figure out how to meet the needs of uh, obviously it's New York City, there's um, a, a lot of different spoken languages. We've got yeah, a we've the, done a we sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> no, we just we've done a few um we have the we have our basic curriculum books in those languages. So it's you know, there's a we have it in English and Spanish and Russian and Chinese and Bengali. Um so the the book helps it be available. I mean it's like a 200 page manual that people can go through. Um and then our trainers speak all those different languages plus Vietnamese and I guess Cantonese and Mandarin. So you know, they could call the hotline and start there with a person getting a, a trainer that speaks their language. And then if they wanted to, if they needed a copy of one of the books and we were, we could provide that or show them pieces of that from the, the curriculum. It helps people to read, it, especially in the languages where, you know, they're depending on the people, they don't always have super high literacy in their own language. So they need somebody who speaks it and can show them the curriculum. But a lot of what you're showing is screenshots. And so if the screenshot has a descriptor above it that explains what the thing is in um, Bengali, then it makes it a lot easier for them to remember, you know, as they go back and start using the device. So um, I think it, it's a combination of having this, the person be able to speak it, they can call our hotline. Uh, certainly when the centers are open, all those curriculum is always available in all the OS classes. Great, We've thank got you. What a great four classes in, in Spanish right now. Wonderful, great resource. And I think um, Alex uh, put the hotline number in the chat for, for providers to look at. Liz? Yeah, I was just going to say we have done projects in Russian. We have Russian speakers. In fact, I think there's some folks from JASA on. Um, in fact, one of our early projects during the pandemic was uh, working with a, a group in JASA in Brighton Beach. Um, and that was actually some good learnings, a particularly challenging project because it was um, with Google Chromebook. So we were literally putting um, Cyrillic uh, alphabet on each individual keyboard. Um, so we learned the tablets are much easier to use for that. Um, but yeah, we, we have been able to support um, in Russian as well. Thank you. Um, so our providers got, got differential training allocations, depending on how many devices they distributed. Some of our centers and providers have large allocations and large volumes of centers or participants and or participants that come to centers. Others are small. Um, and their and their training dollar allocation reflects that. So, do you have any suggestions, particularly for those that have smaller um, amounts of money to spend, in order to support maybe a cohorts of clients that are five or ten or twenty? What, what would you recommend to them? Well, we so we sorry we train our 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 minimum is 10 participants and it's a, on a fee for service uh, on a per participant basis. So we're fully prepared and equipped to, to deal with smaller groups. I mean, I would simply send an email to Alex and say what they're interested in and see if, you know, what we're, what we would might do is plug them into a, a, a program that we're running that we can just add them into. So we don't have to invent the wheel from scratch because we've got stuff available or, um, see if we can get a few different centers to collaborate together or, um, you know, see what works. Or maybe we can provide them with something that helps them without having to charge. So, And I would and say, I the, sorry, uh, actually, um, actually, a small group is is perfect for Rania. Um, and she just did uh, some this week. Uh, and we do it, of course, for free. Um, so we would say definitely for a small group to contact Rania. She has much experience with doing that. Yeah, and I would just echo again, we do work with um, with some small groups, we have, you know, some minimums, but please get in touch, you can email me directly or um, partners at can do tech.com. There's some great free resources from the partners here. And I think, you know, Tom really pointed out too. I know that DIFTA, the allocations were per senior center, but I would also encourage you if you're part of a larger 
group or ecosystem, try to get together and collaborate with your partners, maybe at, at headquarter levels, because I think once you, if you can do that, even in terms of the messaging and the coordination of the strategy, um, that's something that we've seen has worked very, very effectively. So we can work, you know, in each individual center or group, but it's better, you know, we found that it often works better if you've got kind of a coordinated strategy across locations, but we're happy to, you know, talk to folks and see what we can provide. Thank you. So there's so many resources. There's free resources. Um, all of all of these folks are available. All of our panelists are available to you. And I think another important point that a couple of you raised, there's also an opportunity to pool together with different providers or different centers and um, have a partnership strategy that allows you maybe to buy something more robust. Obviously, if you have a bigger allocation, um, then you know, there's maybe um, you know, a more intensive training approach that, that you can buy um, with Justin, our can I, mention, can, can I mention one more thing? Sure. It, it's worth um, saying here that the amount of dollars that are available in this moment is not the end of the, of mm -hmm. the, of the trail here. So uh, next year, there's a lot of new resources coming together. There are private philanthropic funders. There are uh, corporate funders. And if we all know that there's a need and people call us, you know, what, what Lyman did there, they got, you know, resources from New York Community Trust and they were able to, you know, work with us because there was an additional funder that matched it up. But if DIFTA has been giving resources to community centers, those are matching dollars. You can use those to apply for larger grants and we could, you know, put together something a little bit more systematic, so which we do all the time. So just, I mean, make sure that anybody on this call that you want to, might want to work with, we can activate knowing that you've got a need in your community. That's what we get the calls from the, from the foundations all the time, but we're not always sure if there's, you know, where the needs are to, to who to call the, to do those projects. Can I also just add one other thing, which is really important. And again, we, we've learned a lot over the last year and a half is that, you know, Tom, I think talking about long term is really, really critical because what we have seen is, um, you know, if you're on a six month project or 12 month project, you need to have a plan for what happens with those tablets and that support coming off of the project. You know, so again, if we're managing tablets, you know, and you want to have someone continue to use that, are you taking them off of managed device? If you have a, a set um, time frame for classes or lessons or support, what happens after that support ends and someone needs additional support? So I would absolutely say, and again, we, we've thought through this now and been working with a lot of partners is what is the ongoing plan, whether that's, you know, free resources ongoing, internal, or, you know, knowing that you've got a set, you know, three month, six month or 12 month program is really going to be an important part of the planning for everybody. Thank I think you. the other thing I just wanted to mention too with that, with Liz is saying long-term is, you know, OATS has relationships with a lot of the council members in the boroughs who, you know, give resources to OATS to provide services in their districts. So there's another opportunity for us to work with centers um, in those council districts through other sources too. So there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And, and certainly um, DIFTA shares your commitment and investment. And um, as Tom mentioned, obviously the city at large, we started with the 10,000 tablet distribution and partnership with NYCHA. Now, now you've, we've done some smaller waves. This is a big wave coupled with training dollars, coupled with Wi-Fi through June 30th. Um, and there's more to come. Um, some of you have been in conversations with Michael Bosnick and I around how we're going to create a virtual library um, to really access, create a different platform to access and make options clearer, more visible, and more accessible to older adults. Um, so certainly, um, this is the beginning um, of, of ongoing work that we're invested in um, as part of DIFTA's commitment to address social isolation and to promote intellectual, social, and meaningful engagement and activity for older adults. And certainly, 
um, no timing could be more relevant than than now, where um, you know there's still public health concerns for some around in-person engagement, and certainly the part of the world I come from, case management, home care. Um, it, we have a lot of homebound clients, and this provides whole new opportunities and ways for them to engage with senior centers that, that maybe they didn't in the past. Um, so, so we really look forward to that cross-sectionality. Um, Sapir um, wanted to share something in the chat from Visions. Go ahead, Sapir. So I put in the chat for everyone, um, Michael Zeminski, the Technology Services Coordinator for Visions. Um, put in the chat that he's able to help those who have visual impairments um, with training on their devices. So his number is posted in the chat. I'm going to read it out loud for anyone who's calling in. His phone number is 646-486-4444, extension 227. Thank you so much, so Yeah, that is Jocelyn, wonderful. can I? Mm -hmm. sure. That's amazing. Can I mention one other thing? And I don't know, Tom and Brenda and, and Lyman, what you've seen too. We're getting a lot of questions about um, creating a lending library so that mm -hmm. when the tablet, the tablets are not necessarily going out to um, to individuals, but being kept in a center for, you know, just for learning and, and lending on a very short term basis. And, you know, I would say that um, it's something to think about. In our experience, what we've seen is if you do that, it ends up being a bit frustrating because someone can't set up their own email, they can't set up their own, you know, bookmarks, they, they're not saving their passwords and things like that. So um, I don't know, again, Brenda and Tom, what you've experienced, but I would, I would say that um, it's one thing to think about if you have only a small allocation of tablets. And in our experience, it's almost better to give them to a small group and then get them back after a certain period rather than have them rotating and having to wipe them and change change security on a like a daily or weekly basis. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that um, I certainly don't have any problem with, you know, re, like having them go out on a trial so that there is some um, there's the ability to say, oh, no, it was only on loan and take it back person's not using it but I really don't understand the purpose of loaning out a tablet if we're really trying to bridge the digital divide and get that person connected using technology you know if if they're using it you need to have a device that you have all the time it's like sharing a phone with somebody it just doesn't work that being said as I said I mean I I do agree if if, if a tablet is given out to somebody and they conclude that it's just not really for them or they're not going to use it um, or there's no interest, then I think that, you know, it's a shame that it's not being used and it should be recirculated. But I don't, I'm not a big supporter of the um, loaning out of tablets. I, you know, if, if, if somebody is really committed, then what are they going to do when they have to give it back? Yeah, I, I second and third what they all said. We tried it. It hasn't worked really well for us. Mm, interesting. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Yeah, I fifth and sixth that. Maybe a better model <laughs> would be if you had one demo in a location, maybe a demo model in a large location might be a, a thought. Yeah, so, and I'd like to add to that. Thank you, Lyman. Um, certainly, we will be open to the to a demo or demo models um, at your site. So, so what I'll ask the providers to do, if we have tablets left, um, you know, once we finish um, these additional waves, which I mentioned, we're bringing more providers in, the NORCs, case management, and so on. Um, please email your program officer. You're always welcome um, and always appreciate hearing um, advice or questions from people to email me as well. Um, Sapir will put my email address in the chat and um, obviously direct it to your program officer. Copy me. I'm certainly open to hearing ideas. Our aim is to support your participants and clients. Um, so always appreciate feedback. I want to thank everyone for joining us on this Friday afternoon uh, while, while you might be getting ready for the holidays for this important conversation. And thank you so much to our wonderful panelists and fantastic partners in this important work for being here and sharing all your wisdom and approaches and resources and all of their information is there for you um, in the chat and, and look forward to bridging the digital divide together.